What's up guys? I am here with this super awesome A86 Corolla. It's one of my all-time favorite cars and also a very iconic car from the 80s in the world of drifting and track and all that good fun car stuff. So today I gave it a wash and the owner has graciously allowed me to create some video content uh, in regards to paint correction. So we're gonna correct this carbon fiber hood, which you can see is covered in trails and holograms and all kinds of nasty stuff. So we're gonna bring the finish back out. Try to get you a good angle here. Oh yeah, look at all that. Oh, looks like a guy with a 10 inch wool pad and some wax hat at it. So I'm gonna teach you guys a little bit about paint correction and identifying swirls and other imperfections. Uh, give you a minute to pull this inside and let it cool off and we will get started. All right. So, as I said before, I have this pretty sweet A86 Corolla. This is one of my favorite cars of all time. At one point, I had the SR5 Coupe. Uh, unfortunately, I never registered it and it got towed outside of one of my shops and uh, went back to the previous owner after that. Uh, so, today I'm going to talk a little bit about paint correction. Uh, one of the biggest things as a detailer is doing paint correction. That's kind of where we make our money. Uh, paint correction is basically polishing. So uh, a lot of people ask me what is paint correction or they call asking for paint correction thinking that it will fix rock chips or scratches that you can dig your fingernail through or missing paint or fading clear coat. Uh, none of that is true. Paint correction is the removal of swirls and other defects in the clear coat. Um, so there are swirls, which is the big spiderweb type scratches that you see uh, in the finish. And then there's rids. Rids are random individual defects and scratches. These can be deeper scratches that aren't quite through the paint, uh, but they're deep enough in the clear coat that you have to spend a decent amount of time getting them out. So I typically don't chase rids too often unless we're going for an absolute show car finish because the more you polish a car, uh, the more clear coat you take off, the bigger a risk it becomes. And then later on, if you wanted to polish a car again, when you once you get swelled up again, uh, you would not be able to, or it would pose more of a risk of eventually burning through your clear coat. Uh, I'm gonna be working on carbon fiber today. Uh, carbon fiber is one of those things where you cannot use a depth gauge to measure paint with. Uh, because they only usually work on ferrous and non-ferrous metals. Uh, carbon fiber is not one of those. So this carbon fiber, as I showed you in the beginning, is covered in holograms and it looks like it has quite a bit of swirls and defects from the factory. Carbon fiber tends to look really shitty, uh, fresh off the line. It usually has a ton of sanding marks and other defects in the clear coat of the carbon fiber. And carbon fiber tends to fail really quickly as well because I don't know what you guys are doing when you make these panels, but uh, if you don't put some sort of protection, uh, ceramic coating or clear bra, within a year or so of getting sun damage, the carbon fiber usually starts to shit the bed. Um, so outside I showed you that there's a bunch of holograms. Holograms are basically what I'm saying, it's a hologram. It looks like somebody, there's a hologram on your paint. Uh, this comes usually from the guy in the parking lot uh, doing the $25 hand wash and then waxing your car with a rotary polisher, a big wool pad, uh, and a bottle of crappy wax he bought from the store. Uh, when they just kind of buzz your car like this and go all over the place, they're leaving holograms behind. Uh, usually, and they, they most likely did not prep the surface properly either. You wanna clay a car before you do any sort of paint correction uh, to remove swirls. If you're trying to polish a car that has not been clayed and has contamination build up on it, you're just gonna be basically polishing that dirt and contamination into the surface of the clear coat, which could cause more damage. So there are different ways to do paint correction. Um, you can do it in different stages. There are different pads, foam pads, microfiber pads, wool pads. There are all sorts of different compounds and polishes out there. Heavy compound, light compound, heavy polishes, light polishes, uh, dueling polishes, uh, all sorts of stuff. And usually, generally at your average detail shop when you're going to get a paint correction and ceramic coating, you're usually getting a one or a two step correction. So on a one step correction, some shops call this a gloss enhancement. Uh, for me, it's a, I call it a 50% improvement or up to, uh, which means I'm gonna get rid of 50% uh, 
at least of the swirls and defects in the paint. So usually that's getting rid of the top layer of swirls, but leaving those rids behind. Uh, if you're doing a two-stage correction, you're gonna start out a little more aggressive with a microfiber pad and some compound, uh, and you're gonna be taking out a lot more of those deeper defects. But when you're using a microfiber pad and compound, you're also leaving, uh, if you're using a dual action polisher, you're leaving what's called DA haze. So you'll, you're, maybe you got rid of all those swirls, uh, and under one light, the paint looks really nice, but if you were to hold another light, say uh, a scan grip light or the Astro light, and you're looking at it, you're gonna see that there is haze. So that is what the second stage of polishing is for. Uh, using a fine polish and a foam pad removes that DA haze for you uh, and leaves you with that really nice finish. Uh, however, not every, that doesn't always work. Uh, sometimes you can leave so much haze that it's hard to remove. Uh, there is so much science uh, behind paint correction and it's all doing test spots. Every car is different. Uh, there's some car, every paint system is different. If you have a European car, a Japanese car, uh, Korean, American, every paint system is different. So it's going to react differently with compounds and polishes. Some will work better than others. Uh, I always use these days Shine Supply, which I found to be very versatile for various paint systems from either 20 years ago or from today, uh, 2019. So Shine Supply is one of my go-tos. Uh, I'm going to be using Classic Cut, which is probably the lightest grade compound uh, that he has available when I compound this car in a minute. And we're going to start to remove some of the defects. So real quick, I'm going to show you under my Astro Light what some of those defects look like again. So you can see just kind of the outline of the holograms. Uh, with carbon fiber, at least on a camera, it's really hard to see all the haze and swirls that's in there. Let me see if I can adjust the light here. Uh, this is just the basic light. So you can get a light, one of these that's more expensive uh, and also does more color changing as well. Color, different colors can reveal more stuff. So what I've got with you today is I've got a Meguiar's microfiber pad and a Griot Garage orange cutting pad. Uh, this is a more aggressive foam pad, but sometimes the aggressive pads with a fine polish will actually finish out very nicely. So I'm going to start out using the microfiber pad and classic polish. I've got my Rupes six inch polisher. This is the Mark II. I think there's a Mark III out right now. I'd love to get that, but this one works just fine. So we're going to remove some defects so that we can get this carbon fiber on this beautiful little Corolla looking really nice. Once I'm done, I'm going to apply Fine Lab Ceramic Light, a one year ceramic coating that is also available to the consumer uh, onto the paint as well. So it provides some really nice gloss and protection. The reason you would want to do paint correction prior to doing a ceramic coating is because once we seal it in, we're sealing in all of those swirls and defects. So you're going to have to look at those uh, for the whole duration of your coating. Uh, there's kind of, I used to think that if you didn't remove the swirls that it could potentially affect the adhesion of the coating. This generally isn't true, although we always recommend doing some sort of light polish first just to remove any contamination that the clay bar or your iron treatment uh, did not remove first. Uh, that way the, co the coating will bond and also polishing really helps to enhance gloss. There are some places that you know will just do a quick buzz just to enhance gloss and then throw a coating on or they might do the one step or the two step correction or in some cases three or four depending on how bad the paint is and whether the customer what the customer can see, uh, if they want a show car finish or if they're just okay with a minor improvement because it's a daily driver. If it's a daily driven car, you don't need a show car finish because as you wash it, you're gonna swirl it up again anyway. Um, so it's not always worth doing a two or three stage correction. Lots of shops will try to sell you on that and say, you know, you need to do this, you gotta do this, like it's gonna look the best. That's not true. Because most of the time, people don't even know what a swirl is. They buy a brand new car and they say, my car doesn't need paint correction, it's brand new. Well, guess what? Your car is covered in defects. There are very few brands that actually come from the factory uh, with good paint. Porsche and Lexus are probably the top two for best paint. Uh, exotic brands, Ferrari, Lamborghini, are 
known for coming with tons of sanding defects and other marks in the paint. Uh, Teslas, oh my God, are the worst because they paint those in tents outside and it doesn't seem like anyone who paints the Tesla cars or even puts them together gives a shit about it. Uh, so Teslas is like a, sometimes you might get one that looks good. Sometimes you're gonna get one that looks like somebody just sanded it and didn't bother to polish it afterwards or they compounded it with a rotary polisher and then didn't finish it out. Uh, so even if you think that your car is new and it doesn't need paint correction, 90% of the time, I'm gonna tell you it does. Everybody says my car is perfect, the paint's perfect, doesn't need anything, but that's because you're not looking at it under that astro light. So over the phone, I'm not gonna be able to tell you whether you're caught, you're, um, your car has swirls or not, but if I'm able to take a look at your car or instruct you on how to see it properly in the light, which you can do uh, by following the beam of the sun, you can use the light flashlight on your cell phone that actually works really well for seeing defects, stuff that some of those other lights can't pull out because the light is small and more concentrated. Uh, there's all different ways to tell if your car has swirl marks or not. Um, but I'm gonna tell you right now that whether you bought it in 2019 or 2001, you have swirl marks, especially if you haven't cared for it or you take it to the drive-through car wash, which is basically getting your car slapped with dirty towels and brushes all day because all they do is pick up dirt every day. You don't ever wanna go through a drive-through car wash, especially with the brushes. Uh, I would never trust the $25 hand wash or the $10 hand wash because they're using crappy rags that are probably dirty and those guys also don't give a crap. Uh, washing a car may seem like a mediocre, low-end job, but there's actually a lot of technique behind it. And that's what causes swirling usually is improper wash technique, uh, dragging dirt and dust across the clear coat, which I explain in one of my other videos. Um, or, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. I've been talking nonstop. Um, if I remember it, I'll go back to it. But I'm going to do some paint correction right now. So I'm going to mount my microfiber pad to my polisher. You want to make sure that you get it centered because otherwise it's going to cause some problems. Uh, I'm going to brush this pad out because I haven't used it in a bit just to get any dirt out. Quite a bit of dust in here. just starting out with paint correction and you've never done it before, you always want to go with the least aggressive method possible uh, because sometimes all a car needs is a one stage correction. Uh, depending on the paint system, a foam pad and you know a combination of a drop of compound like this classic cut and a drop of polish on the same pad might actually clean your finish up pretty nicely. Um, I can already tell that this Corolla and the carbon fiber is going to need quite a bit of work. So I am going to do about five, just under a dime size drop of product uh, on this polisher, but I'm only going to cut on speed four because I don't want to get too aggressive. So usually you want to work in a two by two section. Uh, any video you watch, you're going to see the detailer moving super slowly and telling you to do this. But in reality, uh, most of us, unless we're being watched or are on video or under the gun, are actually moving a little bit quicker and doing a lot larger sections than is recommended. It still works. Uh, so don't feel like if you are a new detailer that you need to be moving at a snail's pace because you can move relatively quick and correct a car and still have it come out nice. Uh, so anytime you see a video where people are like, oh. snail's pace like that, they're only doing it because they're on camera. They're not actually doing that when they're working on your car at their shop or in your driveway while you're inside. Um, you should always do paint correction inside. Uh, and also generally the best thing to do is you want to prime the area that you're going. So turn your speed down to one. Give it a little bug. Spread the product out and then crank it back up and then you can start correction.
time supply products, usually within uh, you know four to five overlapping passes. Uh, the product is spent. Um, so I'm going to check my work here. I might need to do some more. it on camera. So nice and good, except right down here. You always want to be careful on edges, so I'm going to go back over this and get a little bit closer. But here is the upper area where you can kind of see in between the weave that there, oh, there you go, see holograms and all that stuff. So now that I did that first step, I'm going to finish the rest of this section and then I'll show you what to do with the foam pad. So once you do that, you can see the pad's kind of matted down. This is why we, this is why we brush or blow out pads. You don't want a bunch, well, you don't want to have a bunch of product dust getting everywhere, and then you also don't want to have matted down fibers because they're not really going to do anything if it's matted down. So, again, we're doing on speed core. Uh, some Finishes need slower or faster arm movements. Some need more pressure, some need less pressure. This is a pretty flimsy hood, so I'm not putting any pressure down because I don't want to dent it. down but sometimes when you're holding up against a door I'll see people just not quite doing it. Don't be afraid. You know, have your hand here and your hand here. Oops, I hit the panel. Uh, don't be scared of the polisher. It's very difficult to burn paint with a DA on a flat surface. You, It's more commonly to happen on edges. I used to have a panel that I would use for testing and training and I held down a DA and a microfiber pad for about 15 minutes in one spot. And I thought that I had burned the paint. It was smoking and everything, and then it was all hazy. And then I trained a new person later, and I went to look at the hood after I had them polish it, and it was gone. So it's, uh, it's pretty difficult to burn paint with a DA. A rotary polisher, on the other hand, where it has no throw, it, that is another, another question. The rotary polisher is just forced rotation in a circle. DAs have a throw. 
This is a 21 millimeter throw. So this actually has a really powerful cut compared to a 12 or a 15. And the reason that it's harder to burn paint is because it's not just spinning in one circle in the same spot. It's moving in all different directions. So it's not gonna overheat that one section. But on an edge, panel edge, uh, you, it can still burn. I've done it before. If you've never burnt paint in your detailing career, great for you, but it's a learning process that we all make mistakes. So if it happens, no big deal. If you're a detailer and you burn your customer's car, just take care of it. I've repainted panels before, uh, among other things that we've, we've had to fix over the years. It happens. It's, uh, and usually when you're honest with your customer and you take care of things, you'll earn a lifelong customer out of it. Sometimes you can't win them all, but most people, when you take care of stuff and show your honesty, uh, will continue to come back to you because people understand we're human and we make mistakes. section here because this hood's so big. Uh, I'm not going for a show car finish right now because this is just a demo. I'm not charging for it. Uh, this, this customer was just kind enough to let me use this really cool car for this video. Um, so I'm just trying to get as many defects and at least a hollow brand out. So far though, I've probably made about a 90% improvement over there, which is really good uh, with, for only doing one pass with product. Usually, uh, I, you know, I've had cars where I'm sitting on the same square, reloading my pad five, six, seven times to get all the defects out. This actually cleaned up pretty easily. Metal panels tend to clean up a lot easier than plastic. Uh, if you can't get a bumper perfect or a side skirt, don't worry. The other detailers aren't doing it either because it's really hard to polish plastic. The, the, it doesn't heat up the same way. Uh, basically what's happening right now is I'm heating up the paint and need it for the clear coat but pet plastic panels don't do that very well. So it's a lot, it, it's a lot harder to achieve that finish. And it's also, you know, I don't know a whole lot about spraying paint, but I imagine it has kind of something to do like plastic versus metal, science craft, blah, blah, blah. I'm not a rocket scientist, I'm just a detailer. <laughs> different ways 
you can even sometimes achieve a pretty decent finish using a microfiber pad uh, without having to take it up to a foam pad after. So now that I've kind of broken down the abrasives in this polish, I'm actually going to do some. I just cleaned out the pad, so now I'm going to do something that Shine Supply recommends, which is to take Shine Mist. pad a little spritz with that and then I'm gonna just do like the tiniest little dot of plastic cut now I'm gonna put this back on here and it's the the wetness is gonna help to reactivate some of the abrasives so that I can get a little bit more working time out of my compound that way uh, before I reload the pad I have more I'm able to do a little bit more and also it's gonna to help to finish out nicer. scientific end of things I don't entirely understand everything uh, but I've been doing this so long and been instructed so many times uh, that it just kind of comes naturally one of the things I really like to do is to go to the school uh, that Jeremy Stevens of Shine Supply offers uh, he's probably one of the best detailers out there so I'm gonna check my work really quick this is looking phenomenal so let me just give you guys another little look here. Super clean. There's still some rids. I can see them, you probably can't. And as I said, it's not good to chase those because uh, even though it might drive you crazy, chances are your customer's not gonna see it and you're also just taking off so much clear coat or they might be below the surface in the paint depending on who painted the car. So now here's where it's not done. There's your before and after. I'm gonna cut this part of the video and do a time lapse while I finish the rest of compounding and then I will hop back on and show you guys how to do final polish. Oh wait, hold on. Before I do that actually, let me show you one more thing. Uh, as I was talking about how to hold the, comp the polisher. I'm sure while I was overworking on this corner, you guys probably saw me lift it a little bit when I went into this crevice. Uh, if you need to get into like a body line or something, it's okay to use the edge of the pad. So let me just show you real quick. Yeah. not going to hit inside this little crease. Uh, you'll see, you know, 
Different cars have different body lines, so you might need to angle your polisher. Uh, you should always be using the right size polisher too, so if you're on a panel that you're, is clearly too small to use a six inch, you should switch to a, excuse me, to a five or a three, or if you have the Roots Rupes hybrid, you can uh, use you know, a one or a two inch pad. That way you're hitting, that way you can use the appropriate tool, which also will decrease the chances of burning paint or hitting an edge or something like that. Uh, or smashing the side of the polisher off of a mirror or something that's in the way, door handles, etc. Uh, so when you need to get into these, it's okay to angle the polisher a little bit so that you can actually get the edge of the pad in there. Because although the pad is spinning, uh, that just be where you see the, the edge of the pad, it's not necessarily actually doing anything. It's just kind of an illusion of it spinning. That you, so you might not be getting quite as much coverage as you think. Uh, you also want to make sure that the pad is always spinning. If you're somewhere and you notice that the pad, it looks like the, you know, the throw is working, but it's not actually spinning in a circle or vice versa, you're not actually doing anything. And that could either indicate that that polisher is the wrong polisher for that particular application, or you're putting down too much pressure and you're not allowing it to spin. Okay, now I'm gonna do that time lapse. Hey guys, this is Colin. Stand back a little bit, you're tall. He owns this car. <laughs> he just told me a story that like made my heart melt, so I want him to share it with you guys before I move on to the next section of this video. So this car is actually a bought, not built car for me. I normally do my uh, my own building, but this one came from a very good friend of mine named John, who owns a company called Rally Innovations. Who had a good friend who um, suffered from a traumatic brain injury and lost many years of memory off his life and went from being in his 30s to being in his 20s and thought he was 20 something years old again and one of the things he thought he did was he owned a silver A86 hatchback and John being a great guy with a big heart uh, built this car to sort of you know relive some of those magic memories for Fong who he built the car for and uh, he still takes it every year uh, to go visit him and, and even now that I own it I'm sort of just the, the caretaker of it and uh, Sam's even probably doing more caretaking than I am today uh, but we take it back every year to go visit him on his birthday. I'll send you a picture if you want to splice it in. Uh, but John just took it over there, and it's it's a it's a good thing. It's a nice reminder of uh, how special cars can be. Awesome. Thanks Sweet. for doing that. Yeah, no problem. All right. Well, that almost made me cry. So uh, now I'm gonna do final polishing on this. I'll show you guys how to do that. So I've got my orange. Street out garage six inch cutting pad. Uh, this is a foam cutting pad, but as I said, it can create a very nice finish. So I'm going to do a low speed with this and some shine supply classic polish. Uh, so, one of the things that is commonly done wrong is finishing out a part. Uh, so, as I said, some people just hit this with compound and they get rid of the swirls, and the customer has no idea that it should look any different. So that actually might create, creates, uh, the compound creates haze or a dullness. So this is gonna refine the finish, remove that haze and gloss it up. Uh, now there are times where you're gonna do this and you're gonna look under a light and you're gonna be like, oh my God, like it didn't do anything. What the hell did I do wrong? Well, you might've been too aggressive during your first step. Sometimes when you're too aggressive with a compound or you're using a wool pad or something, you create tick marks in the paint. Uh, and those ticks can be very, although your customer 100% of the time is never gonna see them, uh, they can be very difficult to remove. If you have crazy eyes like me, uh, you probably saw me like, you know, bending over, looking, and that's because I have a work light in this corner and I was trying to follow the light to see if I had run through my product and also see how uh, many swirls and defects I had taken out. 
um, but I have eyes like nobody's business and I can see stuff that's you know not even in the clear coat it's in the substrate or the paint underneath because I spent so much time perfecting cars when I started trying to impress everyone uh, that I just would you know squint until I couldn't see anything other than paint anymore um, so, but what happens when you create those tick marks is you're not necessarily gonna get them out. You might actually have to go back again and recompound the car with a, maybe if you use a wool pad, you're gonna wanna go and take a microfiber pad or even a, a, a more aggressive foam cutting pad and compound to try and remove some of those ticks before you get to your final polish. So uh, there is a lot of science behind paint correction. I could talk about it for hours and hours and hours, but that would make this video really long and boring. It's already pretty long. Uh, and I know you guys probably just want to see the finished result in the sun. So I am going to put some classic polish on my pad. Uh, what's great about this stuff is a little bit goes a long way. I could probably do like three drops and do the entire hood, but I'm still going to go sectional. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put little, little tiny baby drops, just a little bit thick. I'm going to do like four of those. And then I am going to usually, uh, well, again, depending on the finish, fast, slow, sometimes it's fast or slow arm movement. Sometimes it might be a high speed, sometimes it might be a low speed. Uh, paint correction is all about doing test spots. There is no one right way for every paint system. There is a right way to correct a car. Paint correction is not an art form, no matter what anyone tells you. There is a right and a wrong way to polish a car. Um, so given that this is carbon fiber, uh, I'm just gonna do a low speed. It already looks really good. There's no defects, there's no hazing, uh, because Shine Supply is a really, or at least what I did, seemed to work that way. Uh, so I'm just, but I'm just gonna gloss this up before I go ahead and put a coating on it. So I'm gonna go on speed three right now, low speed. Uh, and sometimes if you compounded the car well, polishing can take you 30 minutes to do the car, just buzzing it down to get rid of haze. Uh, if you have, if you, like I said, you had created tick marks or something like that, it might take a lot longer. Uh, but I think with what I did here today, that this is gonna take me about 30 seconds to do the whole hood. <laughs> necessarily be able to hit the same angles in some of these body lines as a microfiber. So it can be pretty difficult to finish out some areas. Don't fret, everyone else is struggling with it too. You need to have the right tools uh, and the right stuff. But like I said, paint correction doesn't have to be 100% perfect, especially you know if you're out there doing you know, $500 to $1,000 paint corrections and coatings, you're just a mobile detailer like me, and you're trying to make some money, you got low overhead, uh, Customers with daily drivers are not the pickiest people in the world. If you're doing a car with a, you know, just a show car finish or a high-end car and you wanna make it, you know, really perfect, if you're, you're probably charging for that too. So you're gonna to wanna to grab the tools you need. There's been a few occasions where a customer asked me to do something and I was like, fuck, I don't have a tool for that. But I just decided to take the deposit that I took from them and buy that tool so I could do the car the right way. Uh, you should be spending your money, uh, if you're earning it, on the right tools uh, for to do the job. Having the right tools to do the job in any profession, whether you are a construction worker or a detailer or a chef, uh, really makes life a lot easier. So I'm just gonna quickly buzz the rest of this hood so I don't bore you with polishing. This is not what I would normally do if I was actually correcting a car, but like I said, this thing's cleaned up really good. It's just a demo car, so I want I showed you what you're supposed to do over there. So now I'm just gonna kind of do the lazy man's polish on the rest of those.
start to stop or something. back into the paint if your towel is not of good quality. This thing looks freaking amazing. There are some ribs, uh, random individual defects and scratches uh, that are probably beneath the clear coat or again something I just don't want to chase. So uh, the next step now is your wipe down. Spray for that. Whenever I misplaced it earlier, I need a lot of stuff. Aha, here it is. I'm gonna grab one. I always used uh, my top quality brand new coating towels uh, to do it. This is using finally on panel prep. This is what you would do before coating a car. What this is gonna do is it's gonna break down and get rid of any oils or anything left behind the polish. Before I got interrupted by a phone call, uh, Fine Lab Panel Prep breaks down oils in uh, the polish that's left behind to prep the surface uh, so that you can put a coating on safely and guarantee your longevity and also you know, not find any haziness or anything like that. I am not the most smooth person apparently. Uh, so, I am going to do this. Most people will say, oh, use an alcohol or IPA. That's bullshit. Uh, that does not at all reach down deep enough or clean out everything. I do not believe in IPAs as polish removers. And I have personally seen firsthand uh, coatings fail due to improper paint prep because people are using alcohol or an IPA to, before they coat a car. Now, panel prep. I'm not sure what's in this, but it's freaking amazing. Uh, if you're using an oil-based polish like uh, Manzerna or Sonax or something, and you didn't do a good enough job correcting it, uh, and you didn't let the paint out gas, this is gonna pull all that VA haze that you just did your final polish on back out. It's gonna say, hey, you didn't do a good job correcting this car. Go back and do it again. Uh, I had to learn that the hard way uh, before I switched over to using Shine Supply fully. Um, and but with water-based polishes, you typically don't find that problem and you're also truly correcting the car. Uh, Fine Lab Panel Prep can be ordered as a consumer on finelab.com as well. You don't need to be a professional certified installer to order it. And that is that. <laughs> so the surface is now prepped for uh, the coating I'm gonna apply, which is Fine Lab Ceramic Light. Uh, a very, very glossy and slick uh, one year coating. I'm going to do another video on Sunday as a, doing a product demo on that. Uh, so I'm not going to ruin that surprise by doing it here. Uh, but I'm going to stop this video in a minute so I can coat it and I'm going to pull it outside so you can see the real final result. But real quick, I'll show you what happened after I polished the car. looks pretty damn perfect compared to the beginning if you guys remember check out this fd this guy has all the cars i love uh, rx7 86 i think uh, i originally came over here to actually do this video on a 86 toyota land cruiser 
but it turned out that the paint was way too crappy for me to do anything at all. And it's also got a 240Z sitting outside too. Uh, so me and this guy are probably gonna be best friends. I love iconic JDM cars and cars from the 70s and 80s. Uh, I don't own one right now because I can't afford to restore and keep them up, but they are some of my favorites. So that has been a little bit of a lesson on paint correction. As I make more videos, we'll go over more stuff different products and all that good stuff. I hope that this has been pretty informative. Um, so like I said, this was a two-step correction. I started with compound to remove the defects and then use the polish to remove the haze. This is something that you can learn easily at home. Don't be afraid of your polisher. A good starting polisher is the Griot six inch polisher. It's probably 150 bucks on Amazon. It has a 12 millimeter throw and it is not very aggressive but it works very well. That's what I started with a long time ago. It's a great polisher to learn on, and then you can upgrade to a root base, or uh, I also still have a Griot's Boss 15 millimeter throw. I love that thing. I've had it for years. It's never broken, whereas I've gone through root base polishers like crazy because uh, for whatever reason, if you use them every day, they seem to bust. Uh, but the Griot's I used for two years straight and had no problems with it, and it still runs fine. It sounds a little crappy, but uh, it's old and I didn't really take very good care of it. So uh, give me a few minutes and I will come back and show you a video of the finished outside. Alrighty, so here's the final result. This hood is super glossy now with Fine Lab ceramic light on it and after paint correction. Let me get over here where we can follow the beam of the sun. And if you remember when I first started this clip, there's holograms and shit everywhere. And now a near flawless finish. So I hope you guys enjoyed my video here working on this awesome iconic JDM car. I certainly enjoyed working on it. This is one of my favorite cars and it really makes me happy uh, that little that little story we shared in the minute in the uh, in the middle of our tribute to Fong here who gets to ride in this car on his birthday every year and I think that is super sweet and uh, this guy deserves a medal. I'm in the purist group on Facebook and they I've been in there a long time and the, that Sean Lee the the founder of purist has done so much uh, for the community and for charity, for children, and all sorts of other things, homeless people, uh, and I think that this guy and his friend definitely belong in Purist. So, uh, man, what a great car. I will see you guys next time. Thank you for watching.